You're collaborating on a session that explores multimodal design. Christine, what, what is that? Multimodal design is an approach to design that takes into consideration the physical senses and the role that they play in our experiences. Um, a lot of the focus on human factors in design that influences technology is really based on human factors that were developed for industrial design, how we use physical objects and environments, and we're entering a new stage of design where we have to think about how we actually use physical information. And so multimodal design is asking the questions, well, how do we experience information in our, in our environment? What does it take? What are the limitations? What are our strengths at observing and experiencing physical information? How should that and could that shape the way we experience technology? Uh, John, how does multimodal design apply to something like the web? Good question. I, I would say that um, the web, like almost every other media, um, is multimodal. It's just that it's multimodal within a very restricted set of senses and modes. Mm. Um, you know, someone sitting butt on a chair facing a computer screen only has a few modes that they're really engaging with. And so design has reflected that and it stayed pretty static. And one of the things that we're trying to do is expand that set of modes because as people move out into the world, their senses operate in very different ways. The way we communicate needs to reflect that. Um, that said, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of applications that are using the web uh, for um, less standard ways that mm. they, that, uh, that they, than they've operated up till now. So connected devices, that kind of thing. That kind of thing. Is the number of modes is expanding, is that, is that correct? Yeah. The web is a part of a lot of different experiences already. Uh, it's just not recognizable as being a browser-based experience. Okay. And I think that's one of the interesting things, which is um, what will the new frameworks for uh, internet usage become? Interesting. Uh, this is kind of related to that. Who, who is doing the most interesting work with multimodal design, Christy? I have my secret conspiracy theories that there are a whole <laughs> bunch of projects out there that I don't know about that are about to blow my mind. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, a lot of the usual suspects, like Google, well now Alphabet, mm -hmm. um, has uh, fractured across, you know, for example, Life Sciences and ATAP and Google X. Uh, and, you know, Apple basically uh, is working on a driverless car. There are a bunch of different projects that are going to, that are really focused on making smarter products, like a driverless car. Uh, but the questions that will come up uh, will be, how do we use our senses in driving? It's been predominantly a physical, um, a, a hand-eye coordination experience. We're looking at the road and we're using uh, mechanical affordances to uh, operate the vehicle. This is going to change. Um, and we're going to be using information instead of mechanical controls to determine where and how we get uh, where we want to go and how we get there. Um, so I think that uh, the question of multimodal design is going to come up in a lot of different projects in a lot of different ways, and we're going to be seeing uh, the results of the sort of investigation very soon. Mm. Yeah, so like, like Christine said, usual suspects are the ones you look for because I mean, they, they have scale, they have broad infrastructure. Um, that said, the the whole idea is is fairly new. The framework is fairly new, um, as well as just the, the 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 physical abilities to function out in the world. Mm -hmm. um, have devices that function in those places. So um, new ideas are coming from all over the place, and and the, you know small companies are doing very interesting things as well. I love the idea that there's a conspiracy of, of projects that are just waiting to blow your mind. I think that's a good way to go through life, right? Just <laughs> anticipating that things are going to blow your mind. Um, something you were talking about uh, made, me, made me wonder about the, the role of designers in all of this. Design used to have fairly clear divisions, right? I mean, you would have print, web, software, hardware. Are, are those divisions disappearing? And, and if so, what does multimodal design, especially as it's going out into the world, what does that mean for designers? I would say that um, those, those different types of roles that you mentioned, um, those different types of media, those... Um, those roles are not disappearing, um, and you know they're getting. So, when photography came along, it's kind of freed painters to be mm -hmm. uh, non-pictorial. Yeah. 
It opened it up. So painting didn't go away. It sort of focused on its core competency, in a, in a, to use modern language. Um, similarly, with these other mediums, um, you know, like they'll be freed to an extent to, to focus on what they are best at. But that said, um, there's just so much interesting stuff going on in all the others that designers will have to be fluent in all the others. And, and there's edges where they start uh, operating together that will be really fertile. Interesting. So you'll see specialization, but also a need to understand across various uh, modes. Is that a fair conclusion? I think so. I mean, um, when I was at Parsons, you know, our first year of school was called foundational thinking. And then after that, we specialized into our specific disciplines. Okay. I think that technology has revealed um, new aspects of design that I think can be shared across all the different design disciplines. Uh, I think the specializations, um, I think that they will, there will always be specialization. I think that it's a little bit more fluid. Like you said before, it's a continuum. People mm. can sort of choose their own subset and have a little bit more um, freedom. There are just uh, such a diversity of ways to experience um, information, mm -hmm. content, um, to accomplish a specific task uh, that um, I think it's going to be more about having sort of a loose range of skills than about having, you know, one specific discipline. We're not as organized by a specific industry or a specific production pipeline for different kinds of products anymore. You could see like a, a designer, um, a web designer that's heavily influenced by film start operating in a very interesting way, whereas a web designer very influenced by print traditions would, would take it in another direction, but both would be pretty interesting. It sounds like it's an interesting and empowering time for designers, though. I think so. I, um, I think that, I think it's an empowering time for everyone. I mean, uh, I think a lot of the a lot of the split between the arts and engineering are becoming really blurry. Hmm. And I think that uh, problem solving and creativity are uh, becoming better understood as not as far apart from each other as people really think. Um, and that's actually based uh, in some part to the science that uh, is part of what we are referring to in in understanding multimodal design about how we actually engage with the world, how we frame problems for ourselves and begin to try to take action on them. Uh, and I think that that's uh, really interesting. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it comes back to human experience, what we want to do, what we need to do. And, um, you know, there are different levels of problems that need to be solved and you know all of the disciplines have different ways of addressing those problems and sort of we come together creating these products and you know we just have many different bags of tools to choose from and they just sort of get all thrown up at, out on the table and um in this sort of exploratory period uh in this sort of um new phase of technology development with the IoT um, and with uh, all these new kinds of products that are emerging, um, everything's up for grabs. Whoever can solve the problem will get to solve the problem. Sure, sure. So um, next two questions are for, for both of you. Um, John, what was the biggest issue or problem, or what is the biggest issue or technical problem that you're facing right now? Um, Energy is one of them when we're talking about devices out in, in, mm. in the world and operating and, um, you know, reliably, consistently over you know, longer periods of time. That's, that's a big challenge. It's not something that I address personally, but I think that's one of the biggest challenges within the field. Yeah. And Christine, what's the biggest technical issue or problem that you're running into right now? Uh, right now, I think it's sort of um, sensory overload. We just have a lot of different products that are now able to vie for our attention, and they are. Mm. And, <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. And um, it, it, it's, um, 
And it's beginning to feel like using our product, our devices, is like, well, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm. Whichever application can you know, demand our attention the most compellingly gets our attention. But that's not really how it should work. It should allow us to focus on the things that we really want to get done and that we really need to get done. And so figuring out a way to create experiences that are sort of holistic to what we need and not necessarily what the app thinks is most urgent for us to pay attention to, mm -hmm. that'd be a good start. Absolutely. And so related to this, and this is the follow-up, so Christine, what, what was the biggest issue or technical problem you were running into five years ago? And, and how did that get addressed if it did get addressed? Um, I actually think that um, this is the pendulum swinging too far in the other direction. It was actually really hard for us to take care of all of our digital chores um, five years ago. We didn't know where they were. We didn't know which application it was in, what web page, which login, and which password. Uh, we had a really fractured experience, and we had to go hunt down all of these little nitpicky digital chores and relearn how to do them every single time. I have no idea how many times I've reset my password for you know, some of the most basic applications that I use that are you know, a part of my experience, but I don't actually have to log in all the time. I use them every two months or three months, long enough to forget a password. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have all of these things that help us uh, keep track of all of these digital chores. And five years later, they're bugging us and reminding us to do them all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, John, how about you? What was the thing five years ago? I, I think it's very similar. Like the, the sort of, you know, even if it, you know, wasn't quite nascent then, but it was enough that it was getting noticed, but now it's reaching an extreme, that kind of free-floating anxiety of, of lots of uh, information overloading us, mm -hmm. um, lots of things competing for attention, um, uh, lots of uh, media addictions that, that are, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously, you know, compelling us to pay attention um, and, and fragmenting our attention. I think uh, now it's getting worse and worse. Mm. Uh, last question for both of you, and John, I'll start with you. What, what people or projects are you following these days? The things that I'm following most recently uh, are, are actually kind of strange and random things. I'm following functional MRI because it shows us a little bit more about how we experience things and what's actually happening in our brain. And that's really kind of in the thread of how we research um, conduct user research. Most user research is very observational um, of how we behave. Mm. Um, and fMRI is actually taking a, a closer look at how um, you know, we're responding internally mm. to, uh, to the information that we're experiencing that you wouldn't necessarily be able to observe in behavior. Um, so that's an interesting topic for me in terms of user research. In terms of actual sort of products and services, um, I'm really interested in sort of uh, semantic processing and really understanding sort of um, latent patterns in, for example, language and behavior and um, like our thinking patterns, uh, because those are going to play a stronger role in, in the way we experience information. Um, from a sort of, I guess, physical perspective, um, there's just so much to keep track of. The hardware space is just completely exploding all over the place. And um, my personal favorite is flyables because um, uh, I secretly wish to be Superman, but that's just me. <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that's sort of fascinating. But I think that from, you know, from the perspective of multimodal design, um, I think that the transportation space and the industrial space are actually really fascinating because it's in the sort of industrial space when we're really focused on accomplishing something. This is where we're really physically engaged and mentally engaged in things in a way where... Um, we're a little bit more laid back mm. in our personal lives. Um, and sporting, 
this is another place where we're intensely focused on our activity and um, the relationship between the tools that we use and our physical experience of the activity are very closely tied together. So these very sort of specialized experiences like driving a car, flying a plane, you know, um, snowboarding, mm -hmm. they actually shed a lot of light on how we um, interact uh, with our physical environment and with the tools that we use in those spaces. And I think that that sort of starts to trickle back into sort of consumer products from there. I can answer now. No, please. Okay, so, um, so I'm a musician <laughs> and uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about sound design and, and, and uh, object design for an interface for, for making music. So I, there's some people doing really interesting stuff. There's um, Madrona Labs that makes this this great instrument out of wood with sensors, and you know you can just approach things differently. Roger Lynn is doing similar things with the Linstrument. Uh, Ableton Push is a really cool device. Just being able to make new sounds. There's this researcher in in uh, Tokyo, Kazuhiro Joe, and he does all kinds of great sound research and, and interface research, but he also has a band called uh, the Sine Wave Orchestra. <laughs> and it, it's kind of, it's, um, it's a band and it's very, they uh, really value user, um, or rather audience participation as well. So they make these little devices, they look like eggs, clear eggs, they hand them out, each one creates a sine wave. And you have say, um, you know, maybe 50 spectators, eight people in the band, creating these different sound waves going in and out of each other. It's really beautiful. So what I like about that is that it's something really simple. It's very hands-on, but it can um, surprise people with the interactivity um, and how that interactivity with sound can make these really profound moments. Well, thank you both for being with us. Really appreciate okay. it. Yeah, thank you.